About a year ago, my neighbor cut down a walnut tree and he gave me some of the wood. Travis and I brought it here into the shop and we showed you kind folks how to buck it up into boards. We tied it all up in a neat little bundle and we invited you to come back in a year and see if we couldn't make something out of this that would reward us for our efforts. Well, here you are and so am I. And you can all guess what comes next. Ow. We let this wood rest for a year for one reason. It was green. It had a moisture content of between 24 and 25 percent, and it was shrinking as it lost water. It wasn't stable. Now we say we have to let green wood dry before we can use it, but that doesn't really describe what's going on. Wood never really dries. It's hygroscopic. It absorbs and releases moisture from the atmosphere. The moisture content of wood will rise and fall 1% for every 5% change in the local relative humidity. The relative humidity here in Ohio is about 40% this time of year. So the wood should have a moisture content of 8%. Other geographical areas will have different relative humidities and the wood will arrive at a different moisture content. But generally, the moisture content should be about 20% of the local relative humidity. When this is the case, the wood is in equilibrium. It isn't shrinking and swelling except in very small amounts as the relative humidity fluctuates. It's stable, mostly. And this is why we let the wood dry for a year so the moisture content can reach a balance with its environment. By the way, some of you good folks have written in to suggest that I add some heat in order to speed up the drying stabilization process. Well, kiln drying is certainly an option, but it's not like throwing your clothes in a dryer. It's an exacting science. Sawyers have developed rigid schedules requiring temperature control and timed exposure, and these schedules are different for every wood species. Failure to adhere to these schedules risks splits, shakes, honeycombing, case hardening, core collapse, and otherwise blowing up the wood. And that's the term that kiln masters use, blowing up. Air drying takes longer, but it requires less work, less energy, and less science to produce usable lumber. As you probably remember, we trussed up the boards with these wires to keep the lumber from distorting as it dried and stabilized. As the wood dries and shrinks, it wants to cup, warp, and twist. Normally, sawyers stack the wood in large piles and let the board's own weight supply the pressure needed to keep them flat. But with these small piles, <laughs> you just don't have the weight. So we use the wires to generate the pressure instead. And as you can see, it works pretty well. After a year, this is still sitting flat on the workbench. You do, however, have to monitor these wires. As the wood dries, it shrinks and the wires get loose. I had to give them a few extra turns twice during the drying process to keep the pressure where it needed to be. And while I was checking the wires, I also checked the moisture content. Now, I've never had a problem with air dried lumber as long as I followed the simple rule of thumb, always let it dry one year per inch of thickness. But I bought this meter so I could look serious about this stuff and I thought I'd better use it. The instructions tell you to take a piece of wood from the stack and cut it at least three inches, that's 75 millimeters, back from the end to expose fresh wood for the test. Well, that's quite a bite when you have a small stack and it's all trussed up in baling wire. So, I drilled two holes halfway through the top board a short distance back from the end. Insert the prongs of the meters in the holes and take a reading. Then plug the holes with some wax. When it's time for the next test, simply use the drill to clean out the wax and fire up the meter. The moisture content that I measured is about what I would expect given the prevailing relative humidity. So I'm going to pronounce this wood air dried, or almost. If you have been drying your wood outside or in a barn or a shed, you need to bring it inside and let it sit in the shop for at least two weeks to shop dry. You see, the relative humidity outside is a little bit different than it is inside, so you need to give the wood time to acclimate to the environment in which it will be worked. 
I cannot tell you how important this is. Once upon a time, I was up against a publishing deadline for a tool chest, this tool chest. And I made the case from wood that I did not take time to shop dry. And the drawers from wood that had been around the shop since God was a little boy. Well, within two weeks, these drawers stood one eighth inch or about three millimeters proud of the case. Fortunately, we have been tripping over this stack of wood for long over two weeks. It's not only shop dried, it's worn out its welcome. So it's obviously time to clip these wires and see what we've got. Drum roll, please. Nice sight, isn't it? All the boards are straight and true, no bad cups or twists. Now we did find that this wood shrunk considerably. Even the thickness is down by a, about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch. But there is 4.2 board feet of usable walnut here. Not bad for a piece of firewood. And what I've decided to make from this firewood is a miniature mule chest, a box with a lid and a single drawer at the bottom. Several hundred years ago, folks referred to their bedroom slippers as mules. They began to put a single drawer in the bottom of their blanket chest so they wouldn't have to store their dirty mules atop their clean blankets. This little chest is much too small to store slippers, but it still has plenty of uses just the same. I use mine to store the overflow from my junk drawer. It's a constant source of those, so that's where I put it, discoveries. Sort of a family time capsule. Let's start with some intensive planning. This is doubly important because the materials are scarce and limited in size. I need to know which of these boards I'm going to use to make what piece. It may help to give some of these pieces a few licks with a bench plane so you can better see the grain and the color. I also need to pay close attention to the grain, not just the direction, but the color and the physical appearance. The grain may appear a good deal more variegated than wood that has been built from a larger log. This is especially true of walnut, in other woods where the sapwood, the new growth, is a completely different color than the hardwood or the old growth. Once I had closely inspected the boards and played around a little bit with their position, I made a 2D drawing showing where I was going to get each part of the mule chest. The boards are numbered and shown in blue. The parts are called out and shown in brown. And I've also made some notes about which boards must be glued edge to edge to get the width that I need. Now this is extreme, I know, and you don't always have to go to these links when you're in the planning stages. But when you're working with wood that has unusual or strong grain patterns and you want to use that to work with or enhance your design, it really helps to think these things through. And there's one more attribute that you want to consider. When you're doing your own sawyering, you can produce boards with live edges. You're looking at the cambium, the outermost growth ring just under the bark. It's become very popular to include these live edges in the design for an organic or rustic visual effect. Now I've only got one usable live edge in this stack, and I doubt that I'll have a need for it, but it is something to consider. Now that we shook hands with the wood and got to know it a little, let's true up each board and plane it to the thickness we need. The traditional method for preparing roughs on lumber is first, joint or plane one face flat and true, then joint one edge straight and square to the face that you trued. Plane the other face parallel to the face that you trued, then rip the other edge parallel to the jointed edge. If you want, joint that edge too to remove the saw marks. I'm going to do all that, but I'm going to insert another step. I need mostly one half inch or 13 millimeter thick stock for this chest, and a smaller amount of one quarter inch or six millimeter stock. We cut the original board one inch or 25 millimeters wide, and we lost about 10% of that as it dried. So if I'm very careful, I can resaw each piece to produce a thick board and a thin board. This helps stretch my meager wood supply. 
So I flatten one face and joint one edge, and then I send the board through the bandsaw to split it in two. Then treat both pieces as you would any other board, truing the faces and jointing the edges, unless, of course, there's a live edge that you want to preserve. If you need wider stock than what you've got, and I do, do your edge-to-edge -edge gluing before you plane the boards to their final thickness. And remember, when planing glued up stock, it needs to cure for at least 24 hours before you plane. But glue continues to harden long after its initial cure time, and at some point it will get hard enough to damage your planer and joiner knives. Scrape away all the glue beads before you plane, and do your final planing within two weeks of the glue. And here's all our lumber, trued and edged. As you lay out the parts, consider actually wrapping the wood around the box. It's an old trick that makes the wood grain look continuous from surface to surface. On this cherry box, I cut the right side, front, left side, and back in that order from a single board. This makes the grain match at each corner except for the back left corner. I don't quite have a board long enough from the walnut log to completely wrap all four parts, but I can get both sides in the front from one board and the back from another. Then I'll just nail the chest down on a shelf so no one can see the back. As you buck up the boards, pay close attention to the chest front. With a little ingenuity, you can make the chest front and the drawer front out of the same board. That way, when you close the drawer, the wood grain will be continuous and the drawer will seem to disappear into the chest. Cut the chest front at least one quarter inch or six millimeters longer and wider than called for. This will compensate for the length and width you're about to lose to saw curves. Then rip the front into three strips. Cut the middle strip into three parts and then glue all the pieces back together except for the middle piece of the middle strip. This will become the drawer front. Line up the wood grain as best you can. And here are all the parts of the chest. These go together into four subassemblies. You have the basic box, of course, and the base that it sits on. And then you have the lid and the drawer. The box and the base are assembled with miters. So let's tackle those together. The miter is a simple joint, but it can be a little tricky to set up. So what I do is first I bevel the blade to what I hope is 45 degrees, and then I make a single cut in a scrap. I take the mitered scrap, reverse one of the parts, and put the two parts together to form a corner. Then I test the corner with a square. The advantage of doing it this way is that if the blade angle is off, the discrepancy will be magnified by a factor of two making it much easier to catch and correct an angle that is almost there, but not quite. One of the most common problems I have when cutting miters is that the spinning blade wants to drag the workpiece right or left. In this case, my left, your right, and just a tiny shift can ruin the miter. So I build an L-shaped fence extension out of plywood scraps to cradle the work during the cut. I stick a piece of 100 grit sandpaper to the base ahead of the kerf, and this is enough to keep the workpiece from shifting. Miter the parts of the box, but hold off on mitering the parts of the base until after you have assembled the box and given it a preliminary sanding. You see, these mitered assemblies have a habit of drifting south of their published measurements as they come together. And it's always best to fit the base to the box you have rather than the box you were aiming for. Next, I'm going to add some decorative dovetail splines to the corners of the assembled box. These not only add visual interest, as you can see right here, they also reinforce the miter joints at the corners. Now, in order to do this, I've built this simple jig that will hold the box while I route the grooves for the splines. The splines are spaced consistently, one inch or 25 millimeters apart. So I've made some spacers to help position the jig one inch right or left for each pass over the router. With the box clamped securely in the jig and the jig up against the fence, make a pass over the router bit. 
add a spacer and make another pass. Continue until you have cut all the spline grooves in a corner and then do it all over again on the next corner. Cut the dovetail splines with the same dovetail bit that you use to make the grooves. Just set your fence to route the dovetail shape in one side of the spline sock. Route one side, then turn the stock end for end and route again. Rip the dovetail tenons free of the stock, cut them into short lengths, and you have your splines. Glue the splines in the grooves. Cut them almost flush with the box surfaces using a small saw. Then sand the splines completely flush to the box surfaces. Now you can make your base. Carefully measure the box after it's sanded, then mark your parts. Route the profile of the base molding. I'm using a simple round over with a tiny flat or listel. Miter the base parts. Then cut out the shapes of the feet on a bandsaw. Glue the parts of the base together and reinforce the corners with triangular shaped glue blocks. These glue blocks also serve to support and position the box in the base. One of the problems that you have to contend with when working from wood that's cut from small diameter stock is its tendency to cup. The reason for this is the difference between quarter sawn grain and plain grain. I'll explain. Plain sawn grain is cut tangential to the annual rings, while quarter sawn grain is radial to them. Depending on the species, plain sawn wood expands and contracts with changes in the relative humidity an average of 8% across the width, and that may go as high as 11% in some woods. Quarter sawn wood expands and contracts an average of 4% and that could go as low as 2%. On any given board, unless it's cut right from the center of the bolt, one side is cut closer to plain sawn and the other side is closer to quarter sawn. This means that both sides expand and contract at a different rate. And that sets up a tension between the two that could cause the board to cup or warp or twist or do all sorts of nasty uncooperative things. And the smaller the diameter of the bolt, the more likely that this is to happen. The lid is a single board with no adjoining structures to help keep it flat. I can deal with this problem by cutting the lid from quarter sawn wood, cut from the middle of the board, which this is. This is the most stable board in the whole bunch. But that's not a complete solution, nor is it the only solution. I can also keep this board from cupping by adding what are called breadboard ends. Breadboards are narrow boards in which the grain runs perpendicular to the grain of the wood that they reinforce. You cut a groove in the edge of each breadboard to slip over a tenon in the end of the lid. Then you pin the breadboards to the lids with dowels. What about the expansion and contraction of the lid? How do you accommodate for that? Ordinarily, I would slightly elongate the dowel holes in the lid tenon near the front and the back, and then glue the breadboards to the lid just in the middle of each part. Glue the outboard dowels in the holes in the breadboards, but not in the lids. That allows the lid to expand and contract towards the front and the back. On this particular lid, I need to add some trim to the underside to give it a lip. Now obviously I need to glue this trim in place, but I don't want to restrict the movement of the lid. So I'm going to elongate the dowel holes at the middle and the back of the box, and then glue the breadboards to the lid near the front edge. The lid will expand and contract towards the rear edge and the trim won't interfere with the movement at all. Once you have made the lid, it's time to hinge it to the box. This means cutting hinge mortises in both the lid and the box. 
Normally, we would position those mortises so the center of the hinge pin, the axis of rotation for the hinge, is even with the outside surface of the box. But on this box, each hinge is set about 1 16th of an inch, or 1.5 millimeters back, outside the perimeter of the box. That way, the lid goes ever so slightly over center when you open it, and the lid's own weight keeps it open while you rummage around inside the box. The rear overhang of the lid acts as a stop keeping the lid at about 95 degrees to the box. Well, it's closer to 96 degrees than it is 95, and I'm going to call this close enough for government work. You know, you can skip the support chain and bracket very easily with a small chest because the lid is so light, but I would not recommend this for a larger chest with a heavier lid. It's easiest to miter, fit, and attach the trim to the lid while the lid is hinged to the chest. That way, you get a perfect fit. Fit the side trim pieces right up against the chest, but put some thought into the position of the front piece. This will move forward and back, away from and closer to the chest, as the lid expands and contracts with changes in relative humidity. It's the dead of winter in this part of Ohio. The humidity is as low as it's going to get, so I can place the trim right next to the chest. The lid is only going to expand from here. Now, if this were the summer and humidity were high, I need to back it off about a sixteenth of an inch or 1.5 millimeters to allow for the lid shrinking. As you're gluing the trim down, don't worry over much about getting glue on the chest or accidentally gluing the trim to the chest. When the trim is positioned and clamped down, simply open up the upside down chest, clean up the squeeze out, and let the glue cure. While the glue is curing on the trim, let's make a drawer. There is no fancy joinery here, just uh, dados, grooves, and rabbits holding the parts together. You can do this either on your table saw or a router table. It's whichever you prefer. For all the joints a quarter inch wide, that's six millimeters for you meter binds, I used a stacked dado set. But for the eighth inch or three millimeter stuff, I cut them with an ordinary rip blade because it leaves a flat bottomed kerf. You must pay close attention when making joinery in the drawer front. Remember, this piece is supposed to match up with the wood grain in the chest front when the drawer is closed. And to make sure this happens, I mark it every which way from Sunday. This includes a piece of tape on the front as a reminder not to cut that side. I would have attached a red flashing light and a yellow highway sign if there had been room. As you can see, the tape worked. You can barely see the drawer at all. The drawer joinery is an ancient design that I used because the bottom is not plywood and it has to be allowed to expand and contract. It slides into the drawer from the back and is held in place by a single nail. This lets the bottom expand and contract. Because the back is so thin, you need to be careful when driving the nail, otherwise you might split the wood. So I'm going to spin the nail in. Clip the head off a wire nail and mount it in your drill. You may have to use a special zero chuck to hold something with such a small diameter. Use the nail like a drill bit and make a pilot hole. Then tap a nail with a head into that pilot hole. I also suggest that you might want to coat the nail with shellac. Expansion and contraction tends to push the nail out of the wood. Resin coated nails resist this. Before you apply a finish to this project, decide whether or not there is something that you want to do about the strong grain, particularly the difference between the sapwood and the heartwood. There is a way that you can see what this project is going to look like when it's finished without actually having to finish it. And that is, wipe it down with naphtha. This is actually a good idea in any event, even if you don't need to see how it will look. The naphtha removes dirt, grease, and oil that the wood picks up during machining and assembly. And then, because it has a relatively high vapor pressure, 
it completely evaporates in a few moments. It won't interfere with your finish, but you have enough time to see what the project might look like when it is finished. It also shows you if there are any glue stains, places that the glue has soaked into the wood and might interfere with the finish. If you do decide that the difference between the sapwood and the heartwood is an issue, there are several things that you can do to reduce the contrast. The easiest is to stain the wood with a water-based aniline dye. This will soak into both the sapwood and the heartwood, darkening both, but it will also bring the tones closer together, seeming to darken the lighter wood more than the darker surfaces. You will have to do some experimentation to get the effect you're after, mixing the dyes with different amounts of water. My favorite way to even out wood tones is a technique that furniture restorers sometimes use to age new wood. It creates an artificial patina that looks to be a hundred years old. Obtain some laboratory grade nitric acid and mix it with distilled water to create a 10% solution. Paint this on the wood and let it soak in for a few minutes. Then heat the wood with a heat gun. The nitric acid oxidizes the wood, darkening it. The patina will appear much the same way you may have seen old photos appearing back in the days when they were developed with chemicals. Work in a well-ventilated area with a fan to help dissipate the fumes. Wear a organic vapor or a butadine mask. If you have one, you do not want to breathe this in. If there are any metal tools in the area, move them away. The vapors could corrode them. <laughs> Travis and I normally do this outside for obvious reasons. The precautions are a pain, but the results can be spectacular. Of course, you can also simply live with the contrasting grain, which is my choice for this project. As long as you carefully read the grain as you build, you can use it to enhance your project. Almost time for the big reveal, but I thought you might like to see this first. These are the scraps from that piece of firewood that we started with. I'm tempted to invite you back in another year to see what we might make with these, but I really think that the best I could do would be a very small fire. And here, folks, is the completed mule chest. Not too shabby, considering its humble beginnings as a piece of firewood. The plans for this firewood chest are available from the Workshop Companion General Store. The links are in the video description, along with some links to some of the tools and materials that I've used. So we have settled the question of whether or not we can do some decent woodworking with firewood. We can. But that leads us to another question. Is all that extra work worth it? The careful planning, resawing to extend the meager wood supply, Anticipating and compensating for the wood grain, reinforcing the assembly against the elevated tendency to distort? Your only advantages seem to be low cost, the possibility of closely matched grain and color, and the availability of live edges. Let me say this. Good wood showcases good craftsmanship. Back when I was starting my first woodworking business, my landlord, whose farm I was renting, kindly let me take down a few trees. I converted these to lumber using a bandsaw and a chainsaw, just as I did with the wood in this chest. The spectacular grain and color I found waiting in those logs was well beyond what I could have afforded at the time. And turning them into usable lumber was an intense hands-on education in the way wood works. This in turn grew my skills and my business. So. Underneath the right circumstances, I would have to say an emphatic, hell yes.